I went to bed last night thinking we've lost the country. I don't know how else you look at this. The percentage of women, single women, uh, minorities, and voters under 30 uh, is so large at this point right. that unless the Republican Party fundamentally changes its appeal to those voters, it can never win an election. Obama won, but he's got no mandate. Uh, he won by going very small, very negative, and we are left as a country exactly where we started, but a little bit worse off. We know what we will get with four more years of Obama. This really is a catastrophic setback to our economy and to any opportunity that we would have uh, for Supreme Court justices. Yeah, what kind of little snooky look there, huh? Uh, <laughs> by the way, pound for pound, I think Dick Morris is one of the worst human beings, but uh, that's neither just here nor there. Just go the other way, bet <laughs> against him, and he'll always win. He, what do you say? 300 and what electoral it's Like 350 electoral 350 votes, maybe that Romney yeah. was walking around with. Yeah. And then this is the classic, never mind. All right, anyway, I digress. Well, some of the reaction, and that's the tame version, trust me. Uh, you go to the fringe ends of uh, right wing radio here, and they were all but going apoplectic, uh, getting ready to get on the ledge here. A lot of folks really not only angry, panicked, frustrated here, talking about somebody stealing their bikes, albeit last night. Is it an indication that? After everything we went through, after this eternal campaign here, um, after finally having a decision and all agreeing that Washington isn't working, that we're having the possibility of coming together or are we farther apart than we even were before the night started here? I want to bring Andrew in. He's got more on that. Some more reaction from the blogosphere, Rich, that would seem to indicate the political divides are wider than ever. First up, a pair of tweets from conservative talker Laura Ingram. Just a thought, she wrote on Twitter. Next time, GOP might want to think about nominating a conservative, a tweet that she quickly followed with, Face it, Republicans, you wish we had a candidate who, teleprompter or not, could speak as forcefully for conservatism as Obama speaks for liberalism. It's a sentiment that was met on the other side by liberal filmmaker Michael Moore on his blog today. He wrote, Mr. President, do not listen to the pundits who call today call for you to compromise. No, you already tried that. It didn't work. You can compromise later if you need to, but please, no more beginning by compromising. So you take all that reaction and you add to it evidence of the political divide from exit polling last night. On gender, men and women voting in direct opposition to one another, Obama winning with women bigger than Romney won with men. On race, Romney took 59% of the white vote, but Obama took 93% of the black vote, 71% of the Hispanic vote, and 73% of the Asian vote. And all three of those groups for Obama voted in greater number than they did in 2008. On political ideology, no surprise when it comes to liberals and conservatives and who they supported. But look in the middle. The president won 56% of self-described moderate voters. And finally, a bit of a shocker on sexual identification. The two candidates tied among straight voters, but the president's big win amongst LBGT voters, or LGBT voters, excuse me, provided the margin for his victory, Rich. It's amazing. The, the, uh, straight voters, a dead tie. But when you factor in the LGBT, that's what one of the groups that put Obama over the top. And I want to uh, bring up right now, if we can, um, our toll-free number for everybody. Uh, and our question is the same question we're going to be talking about at the table here. Um, whether you're an optimist or a cynicist here, uh, what you want to know is the last four years, let's at least agree on this, even if you think the <coughs> president did a good job or bad job, none of us liked it. Um, we had a lot of problems, an economy that almost did, in the beginning was there in a depression here. We teetered between recession and bad economy. Um, it turned around a little bit at the end, but for all intents and purposes, more acrimony that you can remember coming out of Washington in a while. It seemed that they did their best to get nothing done. The approval rating when it was all said and done was less than 10% for Congress, an all-time low. So we all believe we want a better Washington, but then the realist comes in and says, what if anything last night makes us think here that they're going to sit back and say, let's get along? And it starts with us, the electorate. Do we want them to compromise in the middle? And, and Dominic, Michael Moore, speaks for a lot of liberals to say, time out. You know, the president tried to compromise here. The right said, well, God, they're not, they're not going to meet him there. No chance. On the flip side, conservatives say, this is the end of the country here. The last thing we're going to do is deal with this, you know, communist president. We're not going to meet him halfway. No way, no chance. Arguably, Andrew, the moderates, um, they were the losers last night. And some of the races here, if you want to loosely call them moderates, the ones that are closer to the center of the Republican Party, they're out of work here tonight. Mm -hmm. Or they got primaried out here before even the general elections happened. 
Now that's the cynical side. The optimistic side is nobody wants to keep going to work here in this environment. You got to think people said, we're going to fight this thing out. And one way or the other, after four years with this guy, um, we're going to give the voters a choice and they're going to pick another way. Well, they chose to keep him around. For whatever the reason is, they chose to go with status quo over Romney. Are you optimistic here that as a country, we're going to put pressure on Washington to get more stuff done? Yes, and what I also think will help is the fact that a couple of the Tea Party folks lost. And so they're now looking in that rearview mirror. They don't have, if you want to use the mandate word, they don't have the mandate that they once did before. Just saying no to everything is just not good enough. So everyone wants to hear the argument of budget, austerity, and cutting back, and so on. But Americans want jobs, and Americans want to deal with all the top issues that you raise every night. And so I think that, and again, call me optimistic, I think that we're going to see at least for a couple of months where they're going to try and make this work. I don't know what's going to happen down the road. But what's the alternative for the president? So you're saying, you know, Michael Moore and so on, and it's easy for him to say that because he's a filmmaker. He's not the one that's got to lead the country. What's the alternative to not trying to make it work? Dominic, I applaud your optimism. Thank you. You're welcome. But I didn't see anything in the results last night that would push uh, lawmakers to working together. I, there are probably some who would like to. But I didn't see any results that came in last night that indicated that's the way it's going to go. And, and on top of that, you talked about all the things that people want. People want jobs. People want security. People, you know, they, they want to defend the United States. But they share those goals but have incredibly divergent paths to and get if there. if you think about it, the brilliance, and I think it is, th that's the word. If somebody said, this president with this economy um, and all the challenges that were attached in a horrific first debate, that his campaign got him over the finish line here. Um, it was one of the most brilliant campaigns I've ever seen run. I'm talking about the folks of Axelrod and Plouffe and Messina. And they did it by going after demographics and constituencies. And by, and by increasing the, the base. Absolutely. And, by, and they, they, made, they, no, they increased they more than sure, a million. They said, we're going to do turnout here and somehow, some way, more blacks are going to vote in 2012 than voted in 2008. Who would have thought that was possible? I would, I would have asked you what were you drinking. Exactly, and they did it, all right? But, Latinos, they, but they also did it as tournament. much by knocking down Mitt Romney and by painting him. I don't care how they did it. They did it. No, no, and no, my but, point is, that is part of the legacy of this election. They said, we're going to do everything we can. Uh, we're not going to get the white guy vote here. So we're going to go for the other ones. And as a, and as a consequence, you'd argue that there's oppositional politics at play. And you got to get your guy elected. But let me bring in some of the phone calls and see what they say. Let's go to Hattie uh, in Poughkeepsie. Uh, Hattie, how about you? You optimistic things, uh, you know, that we, the people here, are going to push for these guys to uh, figure out a way to get stuff done here? Or are we just going to be, you know, going our corners politically like we have been for four years and just, you know, spit, uh, shoot spitballs at each other? Well, I don't agree with the spitballs at each other. People just want something done. I mean, because the economy, myself personally, I've been working practically all my life. I'm a taxpayer. And we just want fairness. Taxes keep going up at my job, personally at my job. They have been, they're giving people incentives to retire early so there won't be any layoffs. There's been layoffs. All the working class people have been working and all of a sudden this happened. We don't know why. The elderly are having a hard time, you know, insurances going up, and it's just due to no fault of our own. But, but that, if I may. Thank you for the phone call, Hattie. If I may, that, that kind of indicates, and that you can see the split in where we are right now just from that perspective, because for somebody who says, boy, they're doing layoffs and they're cutting people back, and, and, and that's bad, and we need to help the people in the middle class, and that's how you fix the economy. But the people who run or own shares of that business are going to say, hey, by thinning out the workforce, we're making our company more profitable so we can hire more people down the road and make more money for our investors. The short answer is you got to hurt everybody here if you're going to get a deal. But it's, um, just, it's and too for everybody incredibly to sign on, past to they the got to both goal. sign on to sacrifice. And that's going to be the hardest political sell, but I think the only sell. You got to say at some end, I'm going to raise taxes, but I'm going to cut spending, spending on programs. If you don't make everybody angry in the deal that they're going to work out, you're not going to get anything done. You can't make everybody happy in this deal. If you share the pain, even though the president's got more leverage, 
that's got a deal that's got a chance to go through. And that's when you shove other stuff in there. That's when you get stuff like immigration reform tossed into I it. That's when more. you get other stuff <clears throat> that the Republicans will say, if they were smart, they'd push immigration reform. We're going to get into that subject in a second. And when we come back from the break here, we are asking you if the election, as we said here, further unites or divide us. And we're asking you at home to sound off. When we come back, we go straight to the phone calls here. You heard from Hattie. We're going to hear from you. Stay with us. More of your reaction straight ahead. <laughs> 